Rangers fans, welcome to season three of Liberty Blue, the essential New York Rangers podcast. I'm Andrew Chelney, alongside Nick Zararis. And Nick, the Rangers play the Blues today, but that's like number 74 on the agenda today, 96, if you will, maybe. With the news from Elliot Friedman and LB Kaplan as well, the Rangers might look to move both Jacob Truba, which you know, shock. Stop me if you've heard this. You're telling me this first time. I didn't know that. Yeah. It's just, it's the first time we're hearing about this actually. And also apparently Chris Kreider. Look, there is always going to be the, especially for people like us who are media literate, who work in media, who know how this works. The inside baseball of this is a lot more interesting than the report itself, because frankly, yes, they do need a kick in the butt. You know, two weeks ago, we were both, you know, give Berard a look before Othman had gotten hurt. Let's get Othman up here. Just a a shot in the arm, a kick in the butt, anything to show that the season still mattered because they were taking advantage of the bad teams, you know, beating Seattle, taking advantage of the weak opportunities in front of them. And then you lose to Calgary the way you did, and you lose to the Oilers the way you did. And then all of a sudden, you know, the people who are yelling into the void on the internet about the team not being that good don't seem that crazy. You know, I know sometimes I on the timeline I have the demeanor of an unwell person at the bus stop <laughs> makes yelling, two of us. yelling at anyone who will listen uh, that the, the end is near. Right. But but at a certain point, we're doing the same thing over and over again here. You can change the auxiliary pieces. You know, three years ago, the third line left wing was not Will Cooley. Will Cooley's better than what they had, but Will Cooley, for as good as he is, is not demonstrably making that much of a difference come April or May against quality opponents. He doesn't play enough minutes. He is not dynamic enough of a player. You can look back to, and ultimately, this all starts with the defense. We have said, for the better part of, the last 15 years, you can go back to the Tortorella Rangers. The Rangers aren't good at evaluating defensemen. They fundamentally are not good at evaluating the traits that make a successful NHL defenseman. You know, it took the Rangers an extra two or three seasons to realize, oh, the position is trending smaller and faster. While the rest of the league was getting faster and better at handling the puck, the Rangers were still prioritizing things like size, like blocking shots like physicality and hashtag none warrior of the, mentality etc and none of their physical defensemen are actually physical all of that much you know like Truba's the most passive defenseman in the entire nhl as far as stepping up in the neutral zone to make a play yeah. on the puck except he, for when he could turn a 2v2 into a 2v1 when he can yeah. go and chicken hunt people hey man as long as i live i'm never gonna forget him pulling up to go after someone who didn't have the puck in an elimination game yeah. against the Panthers. That that play has been seared into, into my, into my brain. Skull. That and him up. launching himself headfirst into the glass trying to check Nietzsche's, who yeah. very clearly said, oh, that's a grown man flying at me. I'm yeah. going to duck. Also, and then Truba flew over him headfirst the, into the glass. The fact that everybody that is a part of the Rangers organization, front office, watched those two plays and said, yeah, we can bring him back. It's all good. And that's why you know someone's lying. And he's, by the way, still the captain of this team. And that's and that fundamentally is why you know someone is lying somewhere in this process. Yeah. Because the reporting of draft weekend, and I can vividly picture this, because Friday and Saturday of that weekend, the Euros were on, so I was out both days. And <laughs> Copa America, Copa America yeah. was on Friday night. Friday night, we're out, and we're out in Hoboken until like 2 in the morning, and then there's soccer the next morning at 9 a.m. I wake up at 8.30, I see conjecture, blah, 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 what's going to happen in the draft today. And I was standing at a table and Italy was playing Albania. I was standing at a table and I saw the first. This is, by the way, patently absurd. I just want to point that out. I I remember seeing the tweet. Rangers are looking to move Jacob Truba. Deal is in works. Then that was followed up a few hours later. Emily Kaplan also reported deal uh, progressing along not right now but expect this by the end of the day today that's the Mm. saturday of the nhl draft which is a few days ahead of free agency she went on tv said the same thing i remember that very well nhl network yeah Yeah, she went on nhl network and repeated friedman's reporting Mm -hmm. nothing happened saturday nothing happened sunday monday night at about seven or eight o'clock larry brooks writes a column in which he says the Rangers fear that if they were to trade Jacob Truba, he would fail to report to the team he, that acquired him. 
because his wife is still doing the last year of her medical residency. And that was the end of the story. There was no follow-ups. There was no, and then people had the balls to say, well, no, there was no trade. There was never going to be a trade. It wasn't close, even though Elliot and Emily reported. So someone somewhere was lying, whether it was the person that was lying to Elliot and Emily or the person talking to Larry, someone in that sequence was lying. One of those two narratives is true. And we're dealing with the byproduct of that now, four or five months later, wait, June, July, August, like six months later, we're dealing with the repercussions of that six months later, because that was never properly addressed. And now, and the big thing, and the reason I'm kind of mad about this, and I feel like I'm being, my intelligence is being insulted is that they are telling us that, well, Chris Drury wants everyone to know that complacency isn't acceptable. My brother in Christ, you are the one who dictates who's on the team. If you don't want guys on the team, you can find ways to make it happen. Remember when you waved Barkley Goodrow and got unanimous kudos for doing the right thing? That Larry Brooks said you were ruthless and you would do whatever it takes to win. And then a week later, it was, I'm sorry, <laughs> too hard to trade Jacob Truba. Yeah. Can't do that. Do you, you don't get to say the team is complacent when you are the poster boy of complacency. You yeah. have refused to take swings. You have refused to burn assets on swing, on real swings. You know, burning third round picks on Alex Wenberg and Jack Roslevic, a second round pick on Patrick Kane, a second round pick on Nico Mikula and Tarasenko. Those are not swings. You know, I, I forget who said it a few weeks ago, but uh, after one of the games the Rangers lost and Florida had won that night, somebody tweeted to the effect of, Florida won the President's Trophy, had Huberto finished, I think it was fourth or fifth in MVP voting. Bill Zito looked around and said, this isn't good enough. We can do better than this, and swung for the goddamn fences. Now, Chris Drury can't do that because he gave Zbigniew a no-trade clause, because he gave Trocek no a no-trade clause. No-move clause. He's, he's, he's yeah. locked in, baby. Yeah, no. Zbigniew is locked in longer than the island of Manhattan is going to be above water. The, the island of Manhattan is going to be underwater, <laughs> and Mika yeah. Zbigniew and is Florida still going too. to be under contract. Yeah. Look, man, at a certain point, and I said this during the game on Saturday night, I was telling you before, I started watching the game. I was at the AEW show. I saw Big Boom AJ bring the boom. It was the delight. I was very amused. I saw the Rizzler in person. Looks a lot shorter in person than he does on TikTok. But I was watching the Ranger game on my phone. The card was starting to drag. An AEW show is like four and a half, five hours long. The game starts at 10 o'clock. There's still an hour and a half of wrestling on. I say, all right, let me check in on the Oiler game, for, the Ranger Oiler game for a little bit. The first 15 minutes go okay. They let Pod Colson, who hasn't scored a goal since March of 2023, score a goal. And go, well, that's not great. But Edmonton's terrible defensively. The Rangers yeah. can easily get back in And, this you game. know, it was a nice shot. Like, okay, whatever. Yeah, and it was know, a good it was, it was, They yeah, set up a nice okay. goal. Yeah. It was okay. a nice play. Dreisaitl set it up nicely. Sure. It was a good shot, whatever. Yeah. And then they let Yanmark, who, look, Yanmark had a nice run in the cup final to the cup final last year on the penalty kill. Him and Connor Brown scored a lot of shorthanded goals. But to have Trocek, Fox, and Lafreniere, all looking at Matthias Janmark. Nobody busting their ass to come back from the offensive or the neutral zone yep. to come back. And to let Darnell Nurse, who since being violently concussed by Ryan Reeves, has actually played really well. He might have gotten some sense knocked into him, kind of like rookie of the His year. His celebration afterwards, he he's was, like, he yeah, him, yeah. you know, hitting he's his, yeah, knocking his, his own head. I, yeah, it's. The, the the one of the fundamental issues to and that goal is a good example of it is okay let's say let's say Kreider's traded how does that impact the way that Trocheck and Lafreniere and those guys hustle back on defense how does okay you want to move Tr Truba which we've been you know on board with for years now okay you move him he wasn't on the ice for that goal against and. You know, it's one goal, it's a microcosm, but it's really a, a good summary of where this team is at. Where, yeah, you can trade certain people, you can say, oh, no one should be complacent, no one should be happy, and no one should be, you know, comfortable in where they are, but you move one or two people players around you change a couple I thought of we cared about morale, Andrew. I thought yeah. everybody was so close you, and good you, friends that we you, couldn't we couldn't disrupt the locker room. Right. But as soon well, as it reflected sure. badly on the general manager, oh, that doesn't matter anymore. Of course. It, but okay, so you know, you change a couple of nameplates, but how does that change the fact that no one is playing the the structure that that's put in place? Peter no Laviolette, one four checks on this team at all. No Peter one Laviolette has a structure 
I would think so. I mean, he's been in the league for a million years. They I would think he knows how to. They yeah, won they the did do it last year exactly. Well so with not my, a good third line center my, all right. year. My my question is, I'm fully on board with making roster dis- roster changes, as as you are as well. We've been beaten on this drum for multiple seasons now, where bigger name players should be swapped out at this stage of you know of the Rangers' current lifespan and a current you know window, if you if you will. That hasn't happened yet. Maybe, maybe it will now. I kind of, you know, I'll kind of believe it when I see it at this point. But how does that change the mental fortitude of this team? Because again, you can trade Kreider, but that 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 won't make Trocheck back check any any better. That won't make the defensive structure all of a sudden re- realize, oh yeah, we have to do this again. We should we should go and do that. Like we should be here because that's going to prevent the two on one the other way. Oh, if I don't skate back, then Nurse is going to score the goal, which he did. Trading players is good, and you should do that. Right, you know, within is within the Rangers' context. It's something that we've talked about for a long time. But is that going to change the formula? Like that's that's the thing that we have that we, that we have to think about here is. Okay, well, certain players can go, and you're going to bring certain people in. But are those new people going to fundamentally change the way this team functions? No, and that that's the thing. You know, I, we said this after they lost to Tampa Bay three years ago. Said this after the Devil Series. I wrote 3,500 words about it after the Devil Series. The Rangers star players don't play a style of hockey that is particularly conducive to playoff success. It is too volatile and it is too dependent on a handful of players making plays outside of structure and that's i always make this comparison when i'm talking about the oilers because it's the same kind of deal with when mcdavid and dry don't do their part the Oil- the rangers when they're in these funks they're swimming against a riptide you know how at the beach they got the signs that say you're supposed to swim parallel to the beach and get out of the tide well the rangers are stubborn they're going to try and swim as hard as they can against the riptide, tire themselves out, and need a lifeguard to come and get them. And that's Shesterkin. That's Adam Fox. That's Panarin. When the Rangers are in these funks where they refuse to put the work in to grind, to cycle, to forecheck, their game looks terrible. And I know a lot of people say it's laziness. I would argue they are playing even harder when they are playing this badly because they're playing outside of structure because they aren't making smart decisions, because they're trying to speed Forcing up the way pro- too many passes yeah, to that's nobody the biggest in particular. Thing. That's the telltale sign of a team that is struggling, is the c- trans- transition play is, you know, that's like the ligaments and the tendons that connect all the joints and make your body move. When you don't have the transition play, that's your bone on bone grinding against each other. And sure, you can still walk as your knee joints grind against each other, but it feels a lot better when the ligaments and tendons in your knees work. And that's kind of how the Rangers have played hockey for the last week and a half. That, sure, they're still scoring some goals. They occasionally make some good defensive plays. You know, Quick bailed them out against Seattle. They were in that Calgary game inexplicably scoring two goals yeah. in two minutes. Otherwise, Other than that, non-competitive effort. And then Saturday night, Edmonton has been playing mediocre hockey the entire season. They have been very similarly to the Rangers. They have beaten up on bad teams, and they have lost to the good teams they've played. You know, they have three wins against Nashville. They beat the Islanders. They've lost to the uh, Flames. The two they've lost to the Flames two of the three times they've played. They lost to um, Winnipeg the one time they played. Very similar boats, but Edmonton, for all of their flaws, and they have very similar issues to the Rangers in that they don't like to cycle, they don't like to forecheck, they don't have great defense. They have one good defensive pair, very much like the Rangers. But you wouldn't know it based on Saturday night. You know, Matisse Janmark looked pretty good out there for somebody who has like 24 points a season. The, and look, when you're playing McDavid and Dreisaitl, anything bad is going to look eight times worse because of how good those guys are. And the ability to just put so much stress on the Rangers defense. And you never want to say... You don't like doing I told you so because it's unbecoming and part of being smart and part of putting the work in is knowing and feeling confident in your decisions. But at a certain point, man, if the general manager is as good as his job as he thinks he is, where's the proof? Where is the proof? Because if you really felt that this team was close, you wouldn't need to saber rattle 
and say, well, we're yeah. going to start trading guys. If, you wouldn't If you need, felt you were so close, you wouldn't need to posturize like this. Yeah, that, the, that's the thing. It's fake. It's yeah. trying to be something you're not. Yeah. And the Rangers are obsessed like, oh, with Oh, you them. better watch out. Like, I might trade you. It's like, where was the this Rangers, Where was this before? And if, and, if you were, and if you were, you know, actually going to do it, you wouldn't have to wave the stick around. You'd actually just do it. The Rangers are obsessed with being things they're not. They love trying to be physical and tough, and that's why we get Matt Rempe, when they're not that team. You know, if you want to be a physical and imposing team, you get guys like Evan Rodriguez and Sam Bennett, functional hockey players who can forecheck, cycle, and hit the shit out of you. You don't lop on Ryan Reeves, Barkley Goodrow, and Patrick Nemeth and say, okay, we've met our toughness quota, because that's not how toughness works. You adding tough guys to a soft team does not make a team tough. You have three tough guys, and you still have a soft team. It's the same yeah. exact boat right now. The Rangers want a posture that they're this great Stanley Cup contender, that they're really close. Well, if you were really close, you wouldn't need to do this. And it's the same thing how they always say, well, we have a great leadership group. Where is it? Uh, if you need to tell me it's a great leadership group, it's not. You know, it's, it's not. the joke about wearing the T-shirt. Yeah. My, my, my leadership group is so great. I why are you asking me questions about it? If you need to tell me something and because yeah. I can't see it, you know, like you're talking to your English teacher in like 10th grade, show me, don't tell me. Right. Yes. Show me you have good leaders. You know, we yeah. didn't even get the token Truba dirty hit or fight on Saturday night. That's how defeated we didn't they get were. the helmet throw. Where's the helmet throw? You can only play the greatest hit so many times, Andrew, you know, cheap trick can play surrender six times in an hour and a half set, but they do have to play other songs at some point. <laughs> I, 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 look, yeah, we're sickos. I'll, watch the game against sure. the blues tonight but for the love of god if you're watching this do something else call your parents tell your mom you love her do some laundry try a new recipe do a new york times cross there's a million things better to do than watch the rangers play matt rempe and brett, brett berard against the st louis blues and jim montgomery for the love of god matt rempe is gonna get four time. minutes of ice time Zabinaj is going to get double shifted and contribute nothing, and then the Rangers, the Rangers might win this game off of Shesterkin making seventy saves. Bennington, then, hey man, Bennington, Bennington, yeah. the Gerard Gallant owes Bennington a check because he got him through the rest of that twenty one. We all remember this, right? Yeah, we, the yeah, December game against the Blues, they were yep. in the middle of like a four or five game losing streak. They reported it, it uh, retroactively a few months later that if Gallant had lost that game, the plan was to go to Barry Trotz, who was unemployed at the time, to take over in December of that season. Ultimately, Jordan Bennington led into absolute stinkers. The Rangers won in that third period. They stabilized enough to make the playoffs and, of course, lost to the Devils. Yeah. At this well, point... And we got to... Uh, I want to highlight this this comment here because Nicholas Mott is on YouTube live and he's saying, you know, he's not cool with trading a guy who had one of the most clutch playoff periods in, in New York Rangers history. And here's the thing, man. We love Chris Kreider for that period. That was one of the best periods of all time in a Rangers jersey for a player. And he, I mean, you know, his credit, he, he said, he looked around and said, okay, no one else is going to do it. So I have to do it. I have to be the one to do it because there's zero people. There's clearly no one else wants to do this. So I'm going to do it myself. Okay. And then also Freddie Anderson helped for sure. Freddie Anderson did not have the best period of all time. Crit Kreider definitely, you know, put the team on his back. Anderson helped out a little bit. Let's be, you know, let's be objective about it. Yes, I completely agree. And I don't think trading Kreider is the best best option right now hey man I, if you want to do inside yeah. baseball even more on that yeah th there are people who are saying well they had to say somebody else's name with truba just to not hurt truba's yeah, feelings I, I they guess. couldn't just say truba so they had to throw someone else Maybe. out there and they but, know chris Kreider has no emotions and shows no <laughs> affect ever and this won't phase him and that's why yeah. he's not the captain of the team right, if you like sure. the inside baseball and the conjecture and trying to theorize that's the argument here Kreider isn't playing well but he's not no Kreider. Kreider isn't the, the He's not playing particularly well. And the five on five issues have been, you know, growing, uh, you know, a couple for, for a couple of seasons now. But at, and would you say he's one of the problems? I mean, you could, you know, there's a, there's an argument to be had there, especially a five on five on the power play. So lethal when he gets in front of the net, he's one of the best deflect, you know, deflection goal scorers in the history of the NHL. But even with that aside, that period was fantastic. And we'll remember that period forever. That shouldn't be the reason why you trade or don't trade somebody. One period for, for as great as that 20 minutes was, 
for as fantastic as those shifts were, though that 20 minutes should not be the be all end all for we should trade him immediately, we should never trade him ever. Those extremes based off 20 minutes get you nowhere. And if trading Chris Kreider somehow, some way gets you a package in return that immediately makes this team better right now, that is something that Chris Jury has to explore. Like like Nick mentioned uh, you know, earlier on the show, the Florida Panthers won the President's Trophy. Jonathan Huberto was getting a million points, MVP you know, consideration. And, and then Bill Zito, Weger too. Don't, uh, for, yeah, don't and Weger as well. And Bill Zito said, we can still play better than this with with other players and he did it and what do you know the Panthers won the Stanley Cup obviously that is you know a very that's easy an outlier that, that's, that's, an, that's outlier an outlier situation. that's also you know a generalization there's you know clearly a, a multitude of other reasons the Panthers won and you know it's we don't have seven hours to go into a deep dive about the Panthers winning the cup so you know we're kind of over generalizing right now but the bottom line is if there is a trade that makes the team better right now because your cup window is right now. If you call yourself a, a cup contender and you think that you're right there, as you keep saying all the, you know, for all these years that you're, you know, right there, a couple bounces go your way or whatever. Eventually at a certain point, you can't say that anymore. If you keep running it back with the same team and not getting the same results, if there is a trade that makes the team better, you have to at least consider it. Kreider, with that third period or no third period. One thing I want to uh, I want to add on to that. Um, this is also because Drury can't just fire Laviolette after winning the President's Trophy last year because yeah. you know that's the uh, that's the knee jerk solution to this type of problem is you fire the coach and you look for the interim coach bump. Now you lost out on Jim Montgomery. He was he was unemployed for about five minutes. There was five minutes. <laughs> literally there five where, days. The, literally five days. There was a moment or two there where I was genuinely thinking to myself, is there any way I could convince myself to get there? And being at the Rangers, I think are done paying Gerard Gallant after firing him because I think he had a three-year contract. Last year was the last year of that contract. I think there's a world where I could have sold myself on. If they really are desperate and they, they really want to shake things up, they could do this. But then again, that's not the Rangers' M.O., I couldn't tell you the last time they fired a coach in season was what Tom Rennie in like 2009. And then Tortorella took over for like the last 15 games. And that was a Glenn Sather decision. You know, Glenn was a lot more hair trigger. I, I know there are people out there who are saying that Sather who lives in Edmonton now full time is uh, definitely still on the radar. Very well could have talked to Drury over the weekend and tried to inspire something to shake things up. But at a certain point, you, you have to. Is take this really a, a coach problem, though? Because this, no, this, I, I, we this said core, the same thing after Gallant. Like yeah, Gallant wasn't did. a good coach, but like, it's, it's not his fault. The guys don't forecheck. They don't cycle. They right. don't play gap control. I would have to imagine. Right. I mean, I, again, I'm not. Part, I'm not in these practices. So what do I know? But my assumption is that Peter Laviolette, you know, in practice, makes the team practice defensive schemes, forechecking, etc. I would have to think that that is a focus. In practice and also in the film room, the fact that the Rangers do all of that and then go to the game and then don't do any of that, that is at a certain point, not on the coaching staff. Like I can't plug in my controller and make people back check. I just can't like, no matter how much I'd like to, Peter Laviolette just can't, you know, can't Give take over for somebody. Give the a few more years. We'll be there. They'll put we'll, chips yeah, in the We'll be there with, with AI in these implants. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. But as of right now, coaches can't make players do anything. We can, you know, coaches can coach. They coach. can coach. Yeah, they can coach, but they can't actually, you know, play some. You can you lead know, a horse the, to water. You yeah, can't exactly. make them drink. Yeah. So, how much is this is, is a coaching issue? Is that kind of up in the air right now? But a lot of this has to do with how many more coaches does this core have to go through before it's a it's a core problem? And we've and we've by the way, have been very vocal about this being a core problem for a while, but the rest of the organization has to understand that you can't just change the head coach and expect things to change because now this core has been through multiple of them, and yet the, the same problems continue to happen. No matter what coach with a different structure, with a different voice, gets in that room and says you know, all the sweet nothings that the head coaches say, if the Play on the ice doesn't change. What does that tell you about the core? That's 
sounds like it sounds like it's a core thing. I don't know, but you know, what do I know? The one other thing I wanted to talk about, because this came up naturally in conversation that I was having with someone earlier this morning. How is this the Rangers the best they can do organizational depth wise? How is Matt Rempe the 14th or 15th forward to come up? Like that is a developmental player. Brett Burrard, I understand you want to reward him. He's having a good first month. He had a good training camp. That's a little bit different. We all know Matt Rempe needs to play more minutes, and he's only going to get five or six minutes. And maybe this is only a day or two that Kreider's day-to-day injury, and the, it's fine. Rempe will go back down. Same thing with the back end. How how did it make sense to fly Victor Mancini across the continent, <laughs> get him to Edmonton <laughs> at like four in the morning, yeah. get no sleep, practice, and play in a game, as opposed to playing Chad Ruedel, who was with the team was already? There. Yeah. How does that make sense? Please, for the love of God, someone tell me how these decisions make sense. How does it make sense to... And look, Mancini's not ready. How are you going to have a kid who's not ready for the NHL have no sleep, fly cross-continent, and then play against McDavid and Dreisaitl? You know that first the first Dreisaitl goal where he just kept spamming poke check, wondering why he wasn't winning the puck? <laughs> yeah, because he's not ready for the NHL. Yeah. He didn't yeah. move his feet at all. He kept reaching with his stick like it was a sword in a fencing match. Oh, I'm not getting the puck. Something's wrong here. No, that's one of the best players in the world. And you sent a 20-something-year-old who was playing college hockey at Omaha, Nebraska to play against him. That is an organizational failure. I understand you don't have high expectations for Chad Riedel, and the idea is r- ceiling versus floor. At a certain point, yep. we need to be adults here. I understand that the pet projects, they get a lot more run than they deserve. And Mancini clearly is a fifth round pick who's getting NHL minutes over some of the other guys who have been drafted higher. But again, I want to say this because this is part of a larger point. Also, Hito was flown out. Yeah. He's not only with not only the not playing Calgary and Edmonton, he's not playing tonight at home either. So why he couldn't have just used the rest? You know, he could have stayed at home. Why him out? Uh, it's weird. These decisions are weird. And uh, this, this was part of a larger point. The Rangers organizational depth stinks. How is it Matt Rempe and how is Matt Rempe and Victor Mancini the best we can do for a spot start? You know, I understand the AHL has rules. You can only have X number of guys over the age of 25, but that's the point of having those types of guys. You know, I understand that they have really overhauled the way they do things down there and that jury has really used a lot of picks to try and fill out the organization. But like Osman's hurt. I understand he probably would have been the next call up before Rempe for this type of thing. But again, you can't do better than this. This is the team that's going to win the stand. And we talked about this before the season. You're going to go through between 30 and 35 players over the course of an entire season. Just because the first 18 and the two goalies look great, I'm sure there will be a third goalie start at some point this season. I'm sure we will see forwards and defensemen who are not, who have yet to play, get called up at some point. For a Stanley Cup contender, you need better organizational depth. And you don't get to tell me, well, they're doing, they're making do. They'll be okay. When the big guys can't play well and the drop off between replacement level and below replacement level is as big as it is in this organization, that is an indictment of the general manager. You know, as much as we all can sit here, we could talk about what ifs, ifs, ands, or buts, getting in the time machine, preventing this move or that move. We're way too down the road. And at this point, this is what the team is. There is no silver bullet trade. Like, even if you want to get nuts, even if you want to get nuts and say, like, maybe they can try and find a way to do, like, a Trevor Zegris trade. God bless him. Trevor Zegris is not making Mika Zibinijad play better defense. (laughs) He's not. He's not making Vinny Trocek back check. No. He's not making the fourth line be able to cycle the puck. He's not doing that. We'll be lucky if Zegris back checks. Forget about everybody else. Exactly. At a certain point, you are what you are. Yeah. You know? You, and, you can say, and this ties back to what we were saying before about the Rangers caring more about appearances than actually materially changing things. That's what leaking to the media is. It is caring more about how you are perceived than actually fixing what's wrong. Well, if, you know, and the the amount of people that I've got in my mentions, I'm sure you get in your mentions and, you know, as well, that are like, oh, but the Rangers are 12 and 6. Oh, it's fine. They'll, fi- you know, they'll figure it out. It's okay. But, I, but 
you know, and the I goal quote, here isn't to just make the playoffs. Yeah, right. Well, at that, and also, and I quote tweeted one of those one of those tweets, and I was like, me when I only read the box score and don't watch any of the games. But also, you know, I tweeted this out yesterday. It's still true today. Against the teams that are currently in a playoff position, the Rangers are one and six. If you want to say the Canucks are a playoff team, you know, I, I word this in such a way that like the Canucks are currently not at a playoff spot. So I didn't put this on the list. It, if you want to, if you want to add Vancouver to that list and and make them two and six by all means, but the Rangers are currently one and six against players that are currently in a playoff position. They beat Toronto and they lost against Florida, Washington, Buffalo. By the way, a playoff team right now: Winnipeg, Calgary, Edmonton. So eleven of their twelve wins are against teams that are not currently in the playoffs. So. If they're Stanley Cup contenders, allegedly, and they can't beat any team besides, I guess, Toronto that are currently in a playoff spot that will be battling the Rangers in the playoffs, why are they contenders? You can't you can't play Detroit in the playoffs. And even then, they didn't play well against Detroit. It was Jonathan Quick who saved the day. Like... Against Ottawa, who they who is a, a tire fire, they barely beat Ottawa because of, because of goaltending. Like the at the the game against Vancouver was a little bit more. It was it was better. It was one of their better performances. And then they followed it up with a trash camp performance against Calgary, who they only again barely lo- like they only gave up three goals against Calgary, and they gave up like seventy shots. And they 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 play against Edmonton. And they got absolutely destroyed. I mean, it wasn't even close. There was no effort. There was not a whole lot of anything really going on. I mean, John the Quick was left out to dry. You can't blame anything on him because like the team just didn't play in front of him. They said, "See you later. Go have fun against Dry Sidle and McDavid. We're gonna be out here, and we're gonna we're gonna talk sweet nothings into the mic after the game that we you know we're disappointed and we gotta give a better effort. Like at a certain point, things gotta change." At a certain point, you're insulting our intelligence. That's the thing that irks me. I like, I understand that most people don't engage with their sports like critically. They're not thinking about them on a material level that they don't view sports as a product. But like the Rangers are charging you like $140 tonight to get in against the Blues to sit behind the Billy Joel banner and play a bad team. You know, the Blues are not a particularly good team right now. And it's a minimum of $140 to get in. That doesn't account for how you're getting there. If you have to go out to dinner before, if you're going to eat at the game, that doesn't account for drinks. That doesn't account for getting home. At minimum, you are spending probably $200 by yourself, not including anyone you're going with, just to get in the door on a Monday night in November against a non-conference opponent that isn't particularly good. At a certain point, you have to realize that they don't care because they are always going to be able to fill the building with people who will. And that's a testament to the Rangers having a strong, dedicated, and loyal fan base. But I don't particularly want to pay to see this team right now. They start playing better, sure. You know, I usually end up going to more games in the second half of the season anyway as the season develops. But right now, it's hard to get riled up about the results on the ice because this is predictable. Uh, Last year, an outlier. Last year, the results were not this clunky. The transition play was better, at least through the first few months of the season. There was definitely a funk there in January, and then Connor Mackey saved the season in Ottawa, as we all know. But (laughs) Right, right, right. Right? This is predictable. Truba is doing Truba things. Miller looks lost. Other than Adam Fox, I don't have confidence in any of these defensemen. Schneider's fine, but he's not a needle mover. Up front, other than Lafreniere and Panarin... And Will Cooley, I don't really feel any particular way about this group. You know, there's there's just not a lot to be excited about on a nightly basis. Sure, Fox and Panarin and Shesterkin, that's enough against Seattle, against Ottawa, against yeah. Detroit. But as it's often, so, as, as Cat Williams so eloquently put it, Chrysler looks like a phantom till the phantom rolls up. You know, we haven't played Carolina yet. We haven't played the Devils yet. We've played the Islanders only once. We still got to play all of our division games. We still haven't played Pittsburgh, who I'm sure will take a nice chunk out of the Rangers, even if Pittsburgh isn't good. We still got a lot of divisional games to go. We got a lot of conference games. Coming up on Wednesday. 
Yeah, first time playing Carolina all year. We we have a lot of divisional opponents left. We have a lot of conference opponents left, for that matter. You know, we've only played, we haven't played the Bruins yet. We haven't played so, the Lightning yet. The East is hard when you are playing the way the Rangers are. You can get by. And look, I do want to qualify all of this by saying, barring disaster, this team is making the playoffs by accident. You know, yeah. th- they're going to beat the bad teams. There are enough bad teams in the NHL. As we, as we s- talked about. Nick, like we've talked about this pretty much every week for the past three seasons now. Making the playoffs is not the goal. If you have this core in place, anything other than at least a cup final should be viewed as you didn't reach your goal. And what are you going to do differently the next season to ensure that you get to your goal? Making the playoffs with this core is not the goal. I hate when people are trying to essentially whitewash the the way the Rangers are playing with their record. Because, oh, they're 12 and 6. Oh, you know, everything is fine. Making the playoffs is not the goal, dude. It's not. And I don't know how many times I have to say this for people to understand it, but you can win 70 games in a regular season. First of all, you know, the Rangers have won 12 games. A lot of them have not been well, like good games for the Rangers. A lot of those wins, again, that we talked about, have been because of the goaltending. You're going to win as many games of the season as you want. If your game is not predicated to winning in the playoffs, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You have to play in such a way that is not only transferable in the playoffs, but is built for those, those games. I don't care what the record is now. Obviously, I'd rather win than lose, right? Like, that's the goal. You need, you need a win to get to the playoffs. Like, that shouldn't be said. But I have to say that for, you know, for to, to make sure I cross all my T's and dot all my I's here that, you know, I'm not trying to advocate for them to lose. Like, that's crazy. But you have to play games 1 through 82 in such a way that builds up to games A3 and beyond. And right now, the, with the way the Rangers are playing, they are hanging on by the seat of their pants, hoping that Shesterkin or Quick can steal them a game, and then they'll hop on a flight or they'll get ready for the next game and do the exact same thing. Whereas real Stanley Cup contenders will play their game, games one through eighty-two. Obviously, there'll be you know issues with that, and it's, you can't win all eighty-two, whatever. But real cup contenders are building right now week for over week, April game Manjou. over game that's yeah, part of what right. it means to be a Stanley Cup contender you until know, that happens with the better. Rangers they can't call themselves a cup contender I'm sorry but that is that's not what that f- st- phrase means if you are a cup contender that means you are playing not only playing structurally well you are playing in a way that you are beating up good teams and also looking like you know not having nine shots on goal, scoring on five of them, and as the other team has 70, right? Like, that's not how the playoffs... You can't win the playoffs playing that way. You can't give up 60 shots to Calgary and just call it a day and be happy with that. That's not going to work in the playoffs. You are not a cup contender if you play like that against teams that you shouldn't be playing against or against any team for that matter. You're going to be playing Florida. You're going to be playing Carolina in these playoffs. If you can't beat them now and they are outworking you, they're out hustling you, they're getting to lose pucks, their forecheck is better, their structure is better, then how do you propose in April, May, and June when we have to play them again, how do you propose you beat them then, if you can't beat them now? I I will be absolutely floored if they trade Kreider or Truba in season. I just genuinely, I, I don't think it will happen. I, I, I think there aren't any teams I could afford to take Truba. I mean, sure, the Rangers could retain, but at the same time, he's got a list. He's probably blocked a he's lot of the teams. Toys. He's got a lot of teams that would be able to, um, the teams that would be able to afford him, he's almost certainly put on his no trade list to block being traded there. We also have to deal with, as I said, the Larry Brooks report that he might refuse to report, which also might quell any market for him. I don't think it's happening. I, I think this is pure posturing. I think it's very funny that the Rangers immediately went the terrorist route of threatening someone that's cared about as opposed to the person that's actually being the problem. You know, instead of saying we would like Mika Zibanejad to play better, we threatened to trade his best friend as a, as a means of coercing him into better play. You know, if, if you really felt and by the way, that speaks to how bad his contract is. 
Yeah, he's correct. so he's so completely unmovable that the Rangers came out and said, "We are going to trade your best friend if you don't start playing better because we damn well can't trade you." Yeah, and that's the thing, man. When you start to think about this critically as news as opposed to sports, it starts to make sense. And I, I know that's not something a lot of people want to do, but like Elliot Friedman didn't just get like a, a letter in the mail from an anonymous <laughs> like it wasn't like the not the Zapruder, it wasn't the Zodiac killer. Someone didn't cut out magazine letters and put it on a note. <laughs> we Rangers want to trade Truba and Kreider. No, someone close to the team or in the team or an agent said hey, we're trying to find a market for Truva or Kreider. Those are out there. Those reports are out there. The insider sourced reports yeah. are out there for reasons. They are not out there because these reporters are great at their jobs. They also, get also, I hate to, I, I don't mean to cut you off, but what does that say about the leadership group if Jacob Truba was supposedly being traded the entirety of this past summer that didn't happen and now 20 games in the season they're playing completely abysmally and now the report is once again the captain of the team is on the trade block what does that say about your beautiful leadership group if that keeps happening okay i'm gonna make this comparison and it's not perfect because the giants are an atro atrocious football team but and the Rangers, you know, they won the President's Trophy. They went to the conference finals. They've they've made the playoffs in for all three of the last three seasons. I wholly understand that. But after that game yesterday, you saw guys on that team who are not leaders. The, the, the Giants don't have any leaders in the same way the Rangers don't. The Rangers, excuse me, the Giants have good football players. You know, Dexter Lawrence is a good football player. Malik Neighbors is a good football player. I'm not I'm nodding like I know. The, the team respects yeah. Jermaine Eleanor, who is an established veteran, long career, expensive contract. All of those guys said the effort was unserious. We were not competitive. As opposed to what you hear from the Rangers after a bad game where it's, well, we just got to fix our mistakes. You know, we, we competed pretty well. I thought we had some good chances. And look, I understand hockey players are programmed to lose all sense of personality and individualism and the ability to form thought that isn't about getting pucks in deep. But some fire Someone showing some emotion that this is unacceptable. And I, I, I know that's like performative and I, I get on Truba all the time for the fake leadership stuff, but at least somebody show a pulse. Somebody do something that gives me a modicum of a modicum of hope that someone understands there's an issue here. Because I said this after the Calgary game, and I do think it's true. The way that Laviolette kept carrying on with the referees, the way Trocheck kept carrying on with the referees well after the ruling on the hand pass on the Calgary goal, part of me thinks the Rangers thought they deserved to win that game. And, well, we got job by the refs. What do you want us to do when they were outshot like 55 to 30? At a certain point, if the Rangers don't seem to think there's a problem, what are we wasting our time caring this much? Because they don't. If they cared, they would be fixing these problems. These are the same damn problems as last year in the games they lost. As in two years ago, when they showed up very complacent, we traded Ryan Strom for Vinny Trocek, and that was it until the deadline where we added mercenaries who didn't fit the team and were redundant and didn't particularly help the team's cause. Right now, the argument, and I said this last week, and I'll tie a knot on this th thread here, the strongest argument for this team is that the league at large isn't very good. There are enough mediocre and bad teams that the Rangers stars will be able to beat them. They will bank enough points that they can add reinforcements at the deadline and hope they can capture some lightning. For as much as I said about, you know, Carolina, the Devils, Florida, Tampa Bay, Toronto, et cetera, you still got the bottom half of the Metro and the Atlantic. You know, you still get to beat up on Montreal, even though the Rangers didn't really beat up on Montreal. You've got Montreal. You've got Ottawa. I know Buffalo's in a playoff spot, but I don't take Buffalo particularly seriously. I know Buffalo beat the shit out of the Rangers. I don't take Buffalo particularly <laughs> seriously. You've got Philly. You've got Columbus. You've got Pittsburgh. That's more than enough teams in the East for the Rangers to get to the pro points threshold to make the playoffs. But as we've said, the goal here isn't to make the playoffs. It's to win the trophy and have one of those parades because it's going on 30 seasons now yep. without one of those. And this is supposed to be a world-class organization. And I see a pizza manager, a pizza place manager who's very comfortable in his job where he's the general manager and the president of the team. And he gets a lot of money to do both of those jobs. And he's done very little to show complacency isn't acceptable because anytime he's made moves, they haven't really meant a whole lot. 
I want to go back to the tweet that I got yesterday from the the guy that was yelling about the record and how great they were. And oh, the Panthers have lost five in a row. Are they a tire fire? It doesn't matter. They won they their won, Stanley Cup. They won the Stanley Cup. Like, yeah, would they not like to lose five in a row? Yeah, I'm sure they wouldn't. But they just won the Stanley Cup. So by default, like, you know, uh, all, their mistakes are not as magnified. The Rangers you have had a been, grace period. You win a yeah, Stanley Cup. Of course. Of course there's a grace period. And again, you know, I'm not saying that the Panthers should just completely stop playing the, the game and, you know, for them to just pack it up and say, oh, we won. All right. Well, GG's. Talk to you later. That's not what I'm saying either. But with them, it's OK. Well, you've lost five in a row. The mistakes are going to get ironed out. You know, it's a, whatever. Their their issues are. I'd, the, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm back. I don't know. what happened. You're good. You're good. You're good. Uh, their mistakes are a lot less magnified because they just won. The Rangers have been knocking on the door. They keep saying they're close. They keep saying they're a couple bounces away, that they're right there. The same problems have prevailed for year after, you know, years and years and years now. Of the same core with four different head coaches with the same problems. And at a certain point, you know, like you could you could tweet at me and say, "Oh, but this team's losing. Oh, but that team's losing." It's it's not the same. This if isn't you, a, a podcast for one same. of those teams. This isn't a Florida Panthers right. podcast. What You should not be worrying about what the other teams are doing. Is your team doing yeah. everything it can to win these games? And the answer is no. Why right. is that? Well, Trocheck's not back checking. They are that line for as many goals and chances as they create. They are giving more back defensively. Zabinijad and Kreider do nothing to help offensively at five on five. Cooley Kako, they, they're exempt from this conversation largely because they don't play enough to bear of enough responsibility. They are generating enough offense where I have no real qualms. But the one thing I wanted to get in stylistically, because I was talking to Josh Califin about this over the weekend, defense is a team effort. And the Rangers forwards do not participate in that. No, effort. no, they not at do all. not participate in the effort. So, like, as much as I have been disappointed in Keandre Miller's performance this season, as much as Truba and Lindgren have struggled, the forwards need to do more to help. And that's twofold that's actively defending, you know, t- trying to pressure puck carriers and force decisions. And that's part of transition. When you think about it, close your eyes and think about Adam Fox at a regroup behind the net. There need to be defend, excuse me, defensemen. There need to be players at the half walls to receive that outlet pass. When you try that bomb pass out of the zone in one pass over and over and over again, the defense is going to stop respecting you. They're going to force you to thread that pass every single time. You know, that was my lasting memory of the Carolina bubble series was the Rangers spent three games trying to fire 100 foot passes up the length of the ice and Carolina intercepted them. They dumped it back in and force the Rangers to try and break out again, and again, and again. And to play Edmonton, who's very similar to you in their weaknesses in transition, and not make a conscious effort to force Brett Kulak, to force Darnell Nurse, to force Ty Emerson, to force Josh Brown, to make defensive plays is a stinging indictment of the Rangers' attempts to win. You know, I, I don't know if you remember or read, there was an article right after the Dodgers won the World Series where the a couple guys on the Dodgers all said, yeah, the Yankees are a really talented team. But when you actually make them force the Yankees to make plays, that's where you can beat them. Defense, running the bases. It's the same idea here with the Rangers, with Edmonton. The difference is the Oilers didn't beat themselves. They said, okay, the Rangers are going to give us space. Let's attack them in transition. Let's attack them off the rush. The Rangers didn't do anything to try and make the Oilers uncomfortable in dumping the puck in, cycling, forechecking of any discernible any, kind. Yeah. Which, which, which goes back to what we talked about earlier where you, know, you could trade one player, but that all of a sudden will make everybody else magically for check. you could drop Connor mcdavid on this team right now and sure they put up a lot more points he would drive a line by himself eventually someone else would need to be able to score you know i, I made the comparison that the Ra- last year during the cup final that the oilers were the highest end version of the rangers that they depend on a handful of guys you know for them it's mcdavid dry and bouchard to make a few plays to swing games for them at a certain point you get out depth The Rangers right now are facing the lingering probability that they have two and a half of those guys in Shesterkin, Panarin, and Fox. The problem is a defenseman and a goalie 
impact the game a lot less than high-end forwards. You are always going to be able to go further with McDavid and Dreisaitl, McK- McKinnon and Rantanen, even Barkov and Kachuk than you would with Adam Fox and Shesterkin. That's not a knock on those guys. Shesterkin is the best goalie in the world, and Fox is one of the two or three best defensemen in the world. There's only so much they can do if no one else wants to help. And I think that should be the big takeaway from this episode today, Andrew. Even if they swing a trade, even if they bring in Trevor Zegras, if they bring in Brady Kachuk, whoever, that's one person. That's not I don't think fixing. I don't. I don't. Brady. I don't. Uh, Brady Kachuk would be great. I don't think that does anything. I don't I also, think that fixes the problem. I, I, I also. Yeah. T- I, I was sexing with somebody who is you know is closer to the Sens organization, and Kreider is somebody that the Senators would take a look at because they're the kind like he's the kind of power forward big player that the senators would look at but they wouldn't they wouldn't trade anybody close to brady kachuk's worth in return for Kreider. why would they yeah. like that you know as much as the rangers would love brady kachuk i would love brady kachuk on the hockey team sure okay but not only would you have to move Kreider, you'd have to move out a lot more to make that happen like, and again like would ottawa even want to move away from from brady kachuk i don't know but i don't think you know i don't know what the answer is to that but the one one move isn't changing the fundamental DNA of this team, and that is, you know, a problem that takes a long time to fix. Time that the Rangers don't have, nor have started the process of doing. If you want to start fi- fixing the issue, that takes the a while to The time to do fix. this was the summer. Yeah. You had three whole months to, uh, to make changes. And look, if you want to be the ruthless bad guy that Chris Drury tries to portray himself as, that means ruffling some feathers. That means upsetting people. As opposed to as opposed to having your fight behind closed doors after you lost to the Devils, you, when you 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 and Gallant had it out, when everybody heard, the locker room heard whatever, maybe take some accountability. Hey Chris, when do you talk to the media and show your face? When yeah. do you take accountability for these mistakes other than the draft and other than the trade deadline? Cuz I, I have some questions about Mika Zibanejad. I have some questions about Jacob Truba, about Ryan Lindgren. And what you th- I that's what I would love to do. Give me the truth serum. I want to ask Chris Drury what you think the problem with the team is. Because that would tell me everything. Cuz does he think it's that his guys aren't executing well enough? Or does he understand that his guys aren't good enough? Because I really do think, on some level, he thinks they are good enough and they're not playing like it. That would tell me all I need to know. That would tell me this is not a serious general manager. That would tell me he was complacent. And he can throw that word all around, accusatory at guys on the team as much as he wants. He's the complacent one. He's the one who wants to lock himself into guys for seven years with full no-move clauses. He's the one who thinks he's this great evaluator of talent. Don't go and tell me it's the player's fault when you pick them. You know, at a certain point, it's your fault. You don't get to blame just the players. You know, you've gone through two coaches in three and a half seasons. Tell me what the problem is, Chris. Help me understand if you understand, because I don't think he does. I really don't. And, and it comes into the logic stuff. You know, we talked about why'd they fly Heedle to Calgary for him to not play in either game? Why'd they fly Mancini there when they had Rue Weedle with the team? These decisions tell me there is disconnect. There is a problem somewhere. Where the problem is, I'm trying my best here, people. I know yeah. you you can see the gears turning in my head trying to piece together theories. At a certain point, man, why am I going to get this mad? The team doesn't care. Trocek's not backchecking. Zabinijad's not playing good defense. Truba's not playing defense. Lingren's not playing defense. Miller's not playing defense. Why do I? Why should I care more than them? That's what it boils down to. And the Rangers right now are fundamentally one of the most complacent teams in the league right now. They're ha- they're they're cool with it. And until there is reasonable change, either in on ice performance attitude i want an attitude yeah, change sure i would love an attitude change that's not going to happen but i would love that until i see either a big shift in their on ice performance whether that be you know they can still like i'm not saying they have to win every game the rest of the way but i'd like to see them play the game relatively well we saw it we saw it pretty much all of last season they played a lot of good games they beat good teams throughout the course of the year and that built the belief in us and you know from a lot of people around, around the league that the rangers are actual contenders oh they're playing 
well-structured hockey. They can, they're never out of games, no matter what the deficit is. They're always coming back. They're always, you know, putting pressure on the other team, et cetera, et cetera. Until I see that kind of play come back, or until, you know, maybe there's some kind of bigger roster shakeup, whether it be a Kreider trade or Trooper trade or whatever it is, until I see some kind of shift in logic, either on ice or, you know, or personnel, nothing is going to change. We can all talk a big talk about complacency. We can all talk about, oh, we got to be better at, ex- you know, all these bland hockey answers that we've heard a bajillion times before. Until we see a fundamental actual change in something, you can say whatever you want. It doesn't matter. Changing one thing on a team doesn't get the result you want, you know? And I think that's really been my biggest critique of Drury is I don't think he's made conscious enough efforts to get the change he wants. You know, we, we lampooned that first offseason repeatedly because it didn't make Mika Zibinijad play tougher. It didn't make Chris Kreider play tougher. It didn't make Ryan Strom, subsequently Vincent Trocek, play any tougher. The Rangers do not get the desired change they want because they're not taking the action. They are going through the motions. They are adding one guy who does one thing as opposed to trying to develop a team that fits an, a, a singular identity. You know, Florida is great at what they do because everyone buys in. Carolina, regardless of the roster turnover, it works because those guys all buy in. The Rangers take guy from this team, guy from that team, guy from this team, coach from that team, coach from this team, and wonder why it doesn't work. You know, I, I said it, th- I, I always say this, and this will be the last thing I have before we get out of here. Just because someone was successful somewhere else does not mean they will be successful when you bring them to your team. Just because they were successful somewhere else doesn't necessarily mean your team fits what they want, what they're good at. It's like and, every law commercial. Past yeah. results don't 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 mean that you know you're gonna win the next time. Like it, past results don't guarantee future outcomes, right? That's the that's the line. yeah, and especially in something as fluid as sports, where teams run different systems, the tendencies are different. You play with different players, and a lot of this team has been here for a little bit now. You know, this is not year one or two of this project. You know, this is seven years on from the letter about we're rebuilding the team. We're going to start over. And the bones of that are in place. You picked in the top five multiple times. You drafted Miller and Schneider with extra first round picks. You drafted Heedle. You drafted Leah Sanderson. You drafted all of these pieces. You spent money on Zabinijad to keep him because you thought he was good enough. You went out and spent money on Trocek because you thought he was good enough. You run out and spent money on Panarin because he was good enough. Same thing with Truba. You traded for him and extended him because you thought he was good enough to augment the pieces you were developing. And the real bitch of this all is it's not the developed guy's problem. Like I think Cooley, Lafreniere, Kako, Fox, Miller to lesser extent, Shesterkin for sure. It's not those guys' fault this team is where it is right now. It's the guys who have been here, or in Trocek's case, the guys who are supposed to push them over the top. It's those guys who are the problem right now. It is not the younger pieces that are disappointing. It is the big dogs who are supposed to play like big dogs that are letting the team down right now. And that's why this feels more existential than other losing streaks and bad games over the last handful of seasons. We have seen this team over the last few years have moments like this. You know, last year, they got smoked by Vancouver in January. They got smoked by Buffalo in December. They got smoked by Carolina in January. It happens. We're going on year four of this group as serious serious playoff team. I am going to keep watching because I'm a sicko. Andrew yep. is going to keep watching because he's a sicko. Most of the people, if you, I can assume if you are listening to a podcast about the Rangers, that's an hour every week, you're going to keep watching. But at a certain point, I have to ask, is the general manager watching his team? Because the way the Rangers talk about the games they lose leads me to believe that they think, oh, we just got to play better. Then play better. You know, you don't get to do the, I thought we were pretty good. We just didn't execute well enough. We didn't play well enough. Then play better. You know, it, how many? I hate, there's there's got to be. Uh, this is never going to happen, but it'd be funny if it did. There, there, there should the NHL should set, should set a limit of how many times a season you can say that in a in a presser. Skill or issue. A, That's all yeah, it is. It's a skill like, issue. I, how many times can you 
really go up to a mic after a loss and say, we have to play better or the chances were there. We just didn't execute. How many times are you, there should be a set number. You are allowed to say that before you were legally obligated to, to, to say something else, because you can't say we have to play better 70, 70 times a season. Cause at a certain point, like that's a skill issue, brother. Like you gotta, you gotta either, either get people that can play better or, you know, fundamentally change the way this team plays. There's no, like, you can't just, Every every other day. By the way, they just play five games in seven days. Here, I don't want to hear after four of them. Oh, we could have played better. That doesn't. That doesn't. Like, what does that tell me? It tells me nothing, and that actually makes me more angry because you keep saying it. Stop saying it. Actually, go out there and do it. Hey man, maybe we'll get lucky. Maybe Rempe will rip Bennington's skull out of his head like a predator in one of the movies, and we'll get a trophy out of this loss tonight. Out <laughs> because at a certain Hacking point, the better. Man, Hey, we beat Jordan Bennington in December two years ago, and that got Gallant the rest of the season. And also, a week later, gave us the Barkley Goudreau two turnovers to do Jack Hughes goals in against the Devils in December. So, all right, that'll do it for this episode of Andrew and I being mad and rambling of Liberty Blue. Um, we'll talk to you guys, assuming next Monday, barring any trade actually does happen, in which case we'll do something in the interim. But we'll talk to you guys next week. Subscribe to the show. Wherever you get your podcasts, if you're listening on Apple or Spotify, please give the show a five-star review. If you're watching over on YouTube, hit the subscribe button, get the alarm bell on so you get a notification whenever a stream or new content goes live. We will talk to you guys next week. Please, God, make this stop. Later.